Evening, everybody. I'm not Sam. Sam is uh, should be all the way in Florida by now. Did he land already? His flight flight leaves sometime soon, so keep him in your prayers. He'll be gone for I believe the whole week. He uh, had a work trip. He didn't remember when uh, he signed up to preach, and then he called me a couple days ago and said, "I can't preach, so you have to." He said, "Okay." Um, and so interestingly enough, I found myself in a weird situation here uh, because. After last week, I was approached and uh, it was brought to my attention that I speak in riddles, like the the Cheshire cat or the um, the the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland, apparently. <laughs> um, in all seriousness, though, I, I do speak in euphemisms a lot, and, and a lot of what I said last week was solely euphemisms in 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 order to maybe gently bring forward the things I wanted to bring forward. But a couple of people came to me and said they didn't really understand what I was saying, and so. I'm going to bring forward most of what I brought forward last week with no secrets or euphemisms whatsoever. So if you're offended, uh, I apologize, but that means you probably needed to hear it. So uh, I'm going to call this um, Where You Planted Part 2, because that's going to look nice on the website, but really it's a part 1.5 from last week. So if you weren't here last week, uh, and you definitely haven't heard it on the website because I haven't published it yet, that's my fault. Um, this will be brand new to you, and hopefully you'll be able to take something from it. If you were here last week and you completely understood everything I have to say, this might feel boring. Uh, I doubt everyone completely understood everything I had to say, especially when it was brought to my attention. Um, but we're going to revisit a lot of the points that I had last week, and I'm going to go to it in a little more detail. Uh, and, and the sum total of everything I bring to you tonight will be very, very similar to last week. But even if you really did catch everything I brought to you last week. Uh, I spent a lot of time adding a lot more details to each one of the points in between. So there's, there should be a whole lot of new material for you. So scripture reading this week's different than last week comes from first Corinthians chapter three, verses 10 through 15. That's posted behind me and I'll go ahead and read that aloud. Everything I read tonight will be from the new American standard 1995 translation. First Corinthians three, and starting in verse 10 says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. So different aspect than we had last week. If you'll remember a lot of what we studied last week was the, the parable of the wise man and the foolish man, the house on the rock and the house on the sand. Uh, and that's uh, in one of Paul's letters, obviously, to the Corinthians, but it's the same idea about where your foundation is laid and about how, how it has to be built uh, upon the grace that is bestowed to us by God and therefore on Jesus, because Jesus was the grace of God. Jesus is the, the reason that we have salvation and the teachings Jesus left when he came uh, are, are the foundation of our Christian beliefs, of our Christianity. What we do, what we think, uh, how we act all comes from either what Jesus did while he was here or the things that he told us while he was here. So a quick review. Again, where you planted part two. A false sense of security. Remember that. That's going to be more of the theme for this week. Um, again, last week we talked about the wise man, the foolish man, the house on the rock versus the house on the sand from Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27. I'll read that quickly. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man to build his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears those words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. So just like the song we sang in the little kids class, the house on the rock stood firm, the house on the sand went splash. Okay, so we start with, again, this is brief review, review from last week. I'm going to try to to redo as little material as possible. But if you weren't here, we talked uh, about how the foundation of Jesus on the rock, as I just elaborated, uh, brings forward a sense of security and a sense of comfort. And I compared that to uh, 
more current day thinking in psychology and sociology of Maslow's hi hierarchy. And this is a, a, a uh, modern fundamental way of thinking about how mankind operates. And so if you don't have physiological needs, the base of this pyramid or the rock that your house is built on, air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and clothing, you don't have time to worry about higher level things. If you're Mozart and you're working on your classical piece and your house is on fire, who cares? Put your piano down and go put your house out. You got to put out the fire. And then a little further into the sermon, we talked about anxiety that comes when you're not built on that solid foundation. And again, how that solid foundation is Jesus. And we talked a little bit about people that come forward, whether it's from for sin and repentance or just for prayers troubling sickness, things like that. It always comes from a place of near tears, if not tears, not purely out of repentance, but from a place of anxiety. Because when you're away from that solid foundation, when you don't have that base layer like we showed on Maslow's hierarchy, then you're anxious. You're in a place that you know you're not supposed to be. And I showed this picture. And this picture just gives you a sense of anxiety. This guy is someplace he probably shouldn't be. And he needs to back up. He needs to get away. He needs to get to be in a place where he should be. Um, and so that kind of circles us into our scripture reading for tonight, 1 Corinthians 13, 11, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid with Jesus Christ. So clearly this guy has no foundation, no sense of danger either. Um, and so this was kind of the, the sum total picture from last week, and this is where we'll start this week. So I had these three different pictures of, uh, I started talking about the, the house on the rock, but eventually we started calling them castles. And I'll, for the sake of consistency, I'll call them castles again tonight, even though the first one looks like a little house. Um, so the first one was a picture that came up on the internet when I Googled the house on the rock and the house on the sand. The second one is a picture of the castle of Edinburgh. And the third one is a picture of, it's not exactly a castle, it's a monastery called Lindisfarne. I'm going to go back through those guys again today. We're going to talk a little bit more about them in detail. And like I said, I'm going to try not to use any kind of euphemism so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so last week, we completely established we have to have our house built on the rock. So that part's done. That's the grade school level. We're, we're on top of that. We all understand that. Tonight, this is going to be for the established Christian. Even if you're new to it, still relatively, it still works for you. But especially for the people that have been Christians for years and years, especially decades and decades. So these are the people that I'm really getting to tonight. Um, and, and if you didn't see it last week, then and hopefully I can bring it more true to you this week. So the first one, that little house that's way up on top of the butte-shaped rock. Um, again, this is the one that I found when, when I Googled it, and this is the stereotypical house on the rock. This is the Pinterest post that you'd see or Facebook or whatever. Um, but to, to compare this, as directly as I can. This is the guy that builds his house purely on the facts. I'm going to put facts in quotes that he or, or, or gal, guy or gal, facts that he knows to be true. I've stood on these facts for my whole Christian career. They were handed down to me from my dad, from my grandpa, from his dad and his grandpa, all the way back to Abraham Lincoln, clear back to Peter. This, is, uh, this has been handed down generation after generation. This is the way the church is supposed to be. This is the way it's always been. I've cross-referenced it. All these people have told me, and I know this is the way it is. And so when we think about that situation and what might be problematic about that, Maybe I'll say it in this way. This guy might say, I know we're not supposed to have instrumental music, so I'm not going to waste any time arguing about it. I've studied this for years and years. I know it's the truth. This, that's it. But we're done. We're not even going to talk about it. You're not going to trick me into believing that that's the truth because I know that's not the truth, so we're done talking about it. Or the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water. You can read that in the text. That's a quote from the text. So if you even try to talk to me about full immersion not being the only way to be baptized, I'm not going to talk to you. Stay away from me. Don't talk to me. Leave me alone because that's the answer. I'm up here on my pillar and I'm standing on that and that's it. Don't even leave me alone. Don't talk to me about it. How about this one? Hebrews chapter 11 and 25 says, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so that means if you're not here attending services, you might as well be a Satan worshiper. That's it. 
I, I quoted it, Hebrews chapter 11, there it says it. If you're not here in services for every Bible study, every sermon, every gospel meeting, forget it. You're going straight to hell. When I lay them out as those hard and fast, obnoxious rules, it sounds ridiculous, but it's really easy to build yourself up on those pillars, to, to lean on what you absolutely know to be true. And, and to be honest with you, those three things I just said, I'm not standing up here and saying that any of those things are false. I do believe those three things to be true. The last one, obviously, is really an extreme example. But my point is, is what happens when you build yourself up on those pillars and you constantly view the world with a mindset of, I know where I stand and I know where everybody else should be standing and it should be up here on top of this rock with me. There's two problems that come from that. Let's read again like we read last week, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. A lot of you will have this memorized. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect faith, excuse me, have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So if you don't exercise your faith, you are incomplete. James laid it out, that plain and simple. So here's the two problems. Problem number one, if you are up on top of that rock where nobody can reach you or talk to you or have any kind of discussions with you, you're not doing that person any kind of favors. They're not going to grow from it. They're not going to learn from it. They're not going to get any further because all they had was a brick wall and they ran right into it and bounced off of it. And that was their encounter. There was no interchange. There was no uh, growth or learning or explanation. Nothing happened to, to benefit that guy. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch's a good example there. Uh, Philip walks up to him and says, or Philip says, do you understand? And he says, how can I, unless someone teaches me? So here's the, the case in point example. How can you, how can that person do any better if you're up on top of that pillar and they can't even reach you? Because you're standing up on top of those facts you know to be true. And so the conversation is done. Brick wall, stop. Problem number two. As James says there, you're not doing yourself any favors because your faith is not being tested. Even though you're sure of it, even though you're standing on it, even though you know it's that solid rock and it's got you hoisted 400 feet in the air. Um, example, I'm trying to stay away from euphemisms, but if you're cooking something for a party, you're probably going to try it before you serve it to 50 people because you kind of need to know if it's good or not. So when judgment day comes around and you're presenting your faith to God, did you ever test it? Do you know if it's worth anything? Do you know if it's any good? Well, no, I kept myself safe. I was up on top of that rock and nobody tempted me. They didn't, I didn't budge. I did not fail or fault or slide or anything on you once, God. That sounds an awful lot like the parable of the talents. So be cautious not to build yourself up on what you know to be true. Even if it is absolutely true, you're going to hurt not only yourself, but the person that wants help. It could be that simple. They might not be the devil coming at you. It might be somebody with their hands sticking out waiting for a lifeline. There's castle number one. Castle number two, the impenetrable church. So as we talked about last week, this is a picture of the castle of Edinburgh, and the castle of Edinburgh is really, really high up. I think Jake and I decided it was... 10 flights of stairs, I believe, from where this picture is taken up to the very front door. It's a long walk. Edinburgh, if, if you ever decide to go, get some good shoes because there's nothing but stairs in that place. Um, and this castle stood for a full thousand years, give or take a couple decades, because of its impenetrability. It's basically impervious. It's really hard to be attacked because it's up so high and there was no way to get there other than the one single road that went to the, the front. The staircase that's there now wasn't there before. And all there was was this rock wall that you can see behind me. Let's read from Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse three. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So to remove the euphemisms again, the direct way I want to say this is, it's the duty of the local eldership to safeguard this church and to direct us the way that was laid out in the New Testament, the way, the way that was laid out by 
Jesus and the apostles furthermore, it is not our duty as members or as elders to condemn any other church. Let me elaborate a little more after I read from John, starting in 316, a verse we all know and quote an awful lot, but the verses following, that's where I want to spend some time. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. 17 says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not, he who does not believe has been judged already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It is not God's or Jesus' desire that anyone goes to hell. It's our desire as begrudging human beings that people get their just desserts. We think about people like Stalin and Hitler and Mao that did the terrible, terrible things or the, the school shooting that happened just this past week or the last year or Sandy Hook, you name one. These people that do heinous things. The only solace we have in this life is, well, they've moved on to the next one and they get what's coming to them. But that's our fallen spirit. That's not the perspective of God or Jesus. They did terrible things, but we all do terrible things. No one's infallible. The only one that ever was is the only one that saving us and giving us a chance to move on to the next one. Let me give you an example, not a euphemism, an example of something that I heard someone say. Uh, I won't give too many details because a lot of people know this guy, but he uh, he's one of the gentlemen in one of the small surrounding churches that kind of keeps the show running. He's an important guy and very sound in the faith. But I heard him say uh, when he moved away, I won't say to which city because I really don't want to give his identity away, but he, when he moved away for a while and since he's moved back, he was testing churches out and I was kind of talking about my experience and I lived in Miami and Indiana and just places I've been across my life. He said, yeah, I moved to Nashville for a little while. I experienced the same thing. I went to this church and it was too big. There were just too many people there. It had well over 200 members and I just couldn't go. That's just too many people. That's just too much. I had to go find a smaller one that I had to drive an hour to get to. I had to drive outside of the city to go there. And there was a little less than 40 members and that just, that just was felt more like home to me. And I can't begrudge him for that. It probably did feel like home because he's only ever been in a small congregation. But I'm sure each and every one of you has heard somebody say, those mega churches, that's just, there has to be something wrong with that. There's just too many people. There can't be something right about that. Once you have too many people, things are just going to go wrong and it's just all bad. Churches need to be small. There needs to only be a few people. You want to have a big enough number for the show to go on, but you can't let it get too big because bad stuff happens. That's crazy. When you talk about, when we read about the church at Ephesus, the church at Antioch, the church at, you name one of the Paul's epistles, that was the church of the town. It wasn't a few people that met together in Antioch. That was the church. When you read about Jesus' salvation, or Jesus' teachings, rather, 5,000 people were baptized at once. And here we are. We're a congregation, one of the more sound and solid and large ones in the area. We've got less than 100 people. There's 4,500 people inside the city limits here. Between my mom and I at our office, we have over 22,000 patients. That's how many people commute to Barnesville here. And we've got this solid church, less than 100 people. So beware of the walled castle that's lifted up high and it's impenetrable and it's solid and it's sound and it's safe because it might not be so inviting. It might not be so easy to get more people saved. It might not be so easy to bring more souls to heaven. Again, reflecting back. This is for us as Christians, this whole sermon. Reflecting back on your life as a Christian when you're standing there on judgment day and you say, yep, we kept West Main running. My whole life we kept about 100 people. It was great. We kept it rolling. And how many people live just in this little tiny town? And I'm not casting aspersions here on Barnesville because I've been to churches in bigger cities and I mean, churches of Christ just typically aren't that big. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive for that. That should be our goal, to get each and every person to heaven, let alone whether they deserve their just desserts, how bad of a person they are, or what kind of example they set, or what that'll look like on the church when those people come. We need to be really careful. 1 Corinthians 9 and 19 says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became a Jew, so that I might win Jews 
to those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I may win those who are without law. 22 says, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And that's as eloquently put as I could even put it. I become all things to all men, so that I may save some. We are not going to save all men, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And lastly, I talked about the castle of Lindisfarne, and I spent very, very little time on it. So I'm going to give it a little more, a uh, little more effort tonight. The Lindisfarne was not actually a castle; it was a um, monastery. There were monks that lived there, and, and it's not far from Edinburgh. If if you know anything about geography of the, the British Islands, Edinburgh is very, very far north. It's above England on the south side of Scotland. And as you're taking the train to Edinburgh, you can see this out on the coast. When you're looking toward the water, there's a little white, looks like a big giant rock, but it's this castle. And uh, again, I keep calling it a castle because it looks like a castle. I mean, that, that's a literal picture of it. And what happened here uh, was this was the center of what they called Celtic Christianity. So this was kind of how Christianity made its way into the British Isles. Um, and they were just doing their thing, chugging along, you know, transcripting Bibles and texts and, and just things of the mid medieval times. They lived different lives than we did, but trying to be the same Christians we are, still part of the New Testament. And they were attacked by the Vikings. They didn't know that Vikings existed. They didn't know who the Vikings were. They didn't know where they would come from. They were completely blindsided by these Vikings. And so my question is, how do we prepare for the unexpected? Because they didn't expect the Vikings because they didn't know there was such a thing. How could they have gotten ready? How could they have had this solid house on the rock, the castle on the hill, been ready for this nasty thing to come, come to them that they, there's no way they could have known about it? Let's read from Mark 13 and 33. Mark 13 and 33 says, Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigned to each on his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on alert. Therefore be on alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, or the rooster crows, or in the morning. In case he should come suddenly and find you asleep, what I say to you, uh, I say to all, be on the alert. The extra quotes there, Jesus quoting to the crowd. So let me try to make this point again without euphemisms. Number one is obvious as we read there, be on the alert. Jesus could come today, he could come tomorrow, or you could die more realistically. We see that happen on a daily basis. Ty just mentioned another person that you know the community's familiar with and nobody expects it and you don't know when your name's gonna be called. That one's clear, that one's obvious. Number two, the point I want to drive home a little bit better, and this one I think is a, a, a jewel on, on the crown of West Main rather than something to be <clears throat> reprimanded. Um, I have it listed up there as, as COVID. None of us expected that. For my entire career in the scientific community, there was talk about how we were overdue for an epidemic. The word pandemic wasn't even on our radar, it was just epidemic. Something was coming like the Spanish flu. We didn't know what it was or where it was going to come from. But we know we're 35 years overdue. It was supposed to be here a long time and it didn't come. And everybody was pretty comfortable because hygiene, sanitation, surgery practices, they're all better than they've ever been. And we're doing fine. So why worry? And for the most part, you shouldn't live your life in worry, but you should be on the alert. So West Main, we, we survived it. We learned how to pivot a little bit. We did remote services. We did online services. Our services have benefited from that. We have a lot of recordings now. Uh, I believe dating back to April of 2020, we have nearly every single sermon reported and we have a catalog going on our YouTube page. I mean, our, our ministry is stronger than it's ever been because of COVID. There's no way we could have prepared for that. There's no way we could have known about that. And by the grace of God, we're still here. But my point is, if you're not on the alert and you're not willing to pivot and move and learn how to adapt and overcome and grow, then you're going to get wiped out. And a lot of us see that with churches around us. There are churches that used to be there that aren't there anymore. And something like COVID that nobody ever could have predicted was something scary enough to wipe it out. So don't live your life in fear. 
Don't cower. Don't hide like the parable of the talents. But be on alert. Just be ready. Be ready for whatever can come up and be ready for what you can't expect. So I'm going to close the sermon again tonight, similarly to how I did last time. Matthew 11 and 28 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Be careful when building your city on the hill, because you might build yourself straight up to the point where you're out of reach. People can't reach you. You can't reach them. Your faith is left untested, and those people are left stranded. Be careful when you're building your castle, that it's not impervious, so that we don't turn people away from God. We don't shut people out. We don't strive to convert the 5,000 like Jesus did when he was here. Because a perfect church will only be perfect for a single generation. Then it dies out. And you might be that one out on the coastline, just doing your thing, not prepared for the unexpected, because how can you? But when the unexpected comes, you've got to do something. You can't do nothing, or the Vikings will come, or COVID will come. Be on alert. Matthew 11 and 28, we just read. Um, but further on in Matthew, in Matthew 25, I won't read the whole parable, but the parable of the uh, wise and foolish virgins ends with, be on alert then for you do not know the day nor the hour. So as I said, be prepared for whatever happens, but most importantly, the straightforward answer there is be prepared for the judgment. Your day could be tomorrow, could be today, could be 75 years from now. Jesus could come in your lifetime or 35 lifetimes after yours. We don't know. But if you're not prepared, you don't stand a chance. So be careful about that false sense of security. Be careful about, I know what it takes to get into heaven. Be careful, I know I'm in the right church. Be careful, nothing's going to stop me from getting into heaven. Because those are the rocks that those three castles are built on. Those aren't bad rocks. Those are rocks that you need to be attached to. But if you're only attached to those, then you're going to build yourself up into the spot you really don't want to be. If you find yourself in any of those situations and you need the prayers of the church, we're here for you tonight. We'd be happy to pray for you. If you've not started building your castle, as I said last week, if you haven't given your life to Jesus and, and uh, committed to the sacrifice that he's giving to us freely, purely as a gift, not for any reason of his own, but purely out of the, the goodness of his heart. Um. If you need assistance with either one of those, please occupy the front pew while we stand and sing.